We've been in a series these last few weeks to the book of Revelation, and we just finished looking at the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And in Revelation chapter 4, which is where we're going to be at today, if you have a Bible and want to meet with me there, in Revelation 4, we begin to get into the meat of the book of Revelation. And the reason I say that is because from chapter 4 onward, we begin to deal with the symbolism and the imagery that Revelation is known for. And if I can, just to kind of help you understand this better in your own personal reading, the reason why Revelation is so difficult for us to read is because we are a Western culture people. people. When we are asked to describe God or describe what happens, we give details. We're the kind of people that want to make arguments, but this is an Eastern culture letter. So they don't use attributes of God to describe them, they use word pictures. So in Revelation, we're going to have a bunch of word pictures, but we can understand them if we will actually give ourselves over to read them in the original context. And John, from chapter 4 onward, begins to paint this beautiful picture of what is going to happen at the end of human history. And in Revelation 4 and 5, we see the two most important pictures that John is painting. And the reason why Revelation 4 and 5 are the two most important chapters in the entire book is because John is answering two questions. Who is in control? And who has the authority to bring about the end of human history? And he's painting this wonderful picture for us so we can answer both of those questions. And speaking of pictures, you may or may not know this, but I absolutely hate taking photos. Like, I do not like to take pictures. I have never liked taking pictures. That's why if you go to my Instagram, it's basically pictures of Renee or anything but me. I just don't like taking my picture. I've never liked it, but because Renee likes taking pictures, that means I've learned to tolerate it. And one of the ways that I tolerate taking pictures is that once a year, we get together with one of her friends named Alicia, and we take our Christmas photos together. Now, you might have met Alicia. She came here a few months ago, and I'll give her credit. She is fantastic at what she does. She is an amazing photographer, and we actually enjoy those sessions. And while I may not like my picture being taken... She makes the experience far less painful for me than it could be. And so we do it every year, and every time, it's always the same. We go to a few scenic locations, we take some photos, Alicia will show them to us and ask, which ones do you want to keep? And after we pick the ones we want to keep, she takes them and then she edits them. She takes them and she might amplify some features that we like in the photos. She might remove something altogether that's in the background that we don't want in there. Or if there's a feature that I don't like, because Renee has no features that need to be diluted, just me. But if I have a feature I don't like, she'll dilute them. And so the pictures she sends back, if we're being honest, they look good, but it's not the real picture. It's not the authentic picture. It's been edited. It's been amplified. It's been diluted. Stuff has been removed from the picture. And that's how we function as a culture today. We take photos. We don't just post the authentic photo. We want to put the right filter on it. We want to amplify the right parts of the picture we want people to look at, and we kind of want to get rid of the parts we don't like. And I wonder if that has made us have a picture of God in our minds that has been edited and isn't authentic. We live in a culture that spends so much time editing photos, amplifying, diluting, removing. Have we done the same thing with our picture of God? Like when you picture God, do you amplify parts of him that you like and kind of ignore the parts you don't? Do you dilute the parts about God that's kind of hard for you to deal with? And do you want to amplify the parts that are easier? For example, in your view of God, do you believe that God is just all love? And he he never judges anybody. He never condemns anybody. And everyone's going to go to heaven when they die. That's an edited picture of God. You've amplified his love while ignoring his holiness. You've amplified his mercy while diluting his judgment and removing his wrath altogether. Now, your picture of God may not be that extreme, but I would bet that we all have an edited picture of God. We all have parts of God that we find easier to deal with than others. There are parts about God that we might think, well, I have to wrestle with this. So when I picture God, when I view God, he's like this. And we go about our lives not thinking there's a problem with that. Let me be honest with you. If we have an edited picture of God then we won't grow as the disciples he calls us to be. In fact, I would wager if you would claim to be a Christian in here this morning and you would say that, you know, I had this edited picture of God. I know what the Bible says, but to me, God is this. Or if you like your picture of God better than the Bible's picture of God, which, by the way, this is God's self-portrait of himself. 
This is God's unedited photo of who he is. But if we say that we like our picture better, what we've edited more than how God's revealed himself, then let's just be honest. We don't worship God. We worship a God made in our image. A God that's palatable. A God that's easy to digest. A God that doesn't really challenge us or push us. And the problem with that is you won't grow as a disciple because you're either not a disciple, because if you're really okay with rejecting the God of the Bible, we've got to ask some questions. But if you are a believer, then you won't be able to grow. You won't love God more because you don't have the right picture of God. And worse yet, as things get worse in this world, an edited false picture of God will not enable you to endure will not enable you to tackle all the suffering that's going to come. Things are just going to get worse before they get better. We don't talk about that enough, but as the day comes closer for the return of Christ, things are going to get so much worse before they get better. In fact, look at what John is told in Revelation 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I heard had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. So John's just finished writing these these letters, and the voice tells him these things must take place after this. The beginning of the end of human history can begin at any single moment. Every day that we have, we are one day closer to the beginning of the end. And any false picture of God, any edited picture of God, any picture of God that amplifies the parts that we like or removes the parts that we don't will not enable us to endure in this life, especially as things get worse. As the world grows in its hatred of the church and hatred of those who claim Christ. Anything but the genuine picture of God given in Scripture will not enable us to endure. And that's why John gives us Revelation chapter 4. We have Revelation 4 so that we will not settle for a false and edited or a uh, incorrect view of God, but so that we will embrace the clear and complete picture of who God is. Revelation 4 is us seeing the glory and the magnitude of God in a way that we don't see it throughout the rest of the Bible potentially. Revelation 4 is a clear picture of how glorious and majestic and loving God is. And this is the picture that we need. Not the false one. Not an edited one. We need to embrace this picture. And we have three steps to take in this passage if we're going to embrace the clear and complete picture of God. And the first step is for us to recognize the majesty and faithfulness of God. Look at what is said in verses 2 through 5. Immediately I was in the Spirit... And there was a throne in heaven, and someone was seated on it. The one seated there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian stone. A rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald surrounded the throne. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the throne sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with golden crowns on their heads. Flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder came from the throne, and seven fiery torches were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. If you'll notice in those few verses, there is a word used repeatedly, and that word is the throne. Now, why would John emphasize the throne? Why would he emphasize the throne and not just spend all his time talking about the one who is seated on the throne? Why is the word he uses repeatedly not the one on the throne, but the throne itself? Well, because the Greek word for throne is not just an object, but it connotates power, dominion, sovereignty. And so what John is saying, the one who sits on this throne in heaven is the one who is in complete control of human history. He is the one who is sovereign over all things. And so often in our picture of God, we think he's just as surprised at our sin or what happens to us as we are. Oh, but he's not. He reigns. He rules. He's in control. He sees all, knows all, and nothing catches him by surprise. The one who sits on this throne has all power and all dominion. The one who sits on this throne is all majesty. I mean, look at how John describes him. The one seated on there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian stone. And the words he's using here, why doesn't he just describe God? Why does he not just use descriptive terms? Why does he compare him to stones? Because there is no word in human language that can describe the majesty of God. 
And so John is doing the best he can. He's like a jasper, like a carnelian stone, like these beautiful, like these radiant stones that are in this world. That's what he looks like. And what do the stones mean? What is he trying to communicate? He's trying to let us know this God who sits on the throne, oh, he is majestic. Oh, he is majesty. There is none like him. And John can't even begin to describe him, so he uses these similes, or he uses these metaphors, these word pictures for us to see what God is like, and he is majestic. There is nothing in this world that is better than him. There is nothing in this world more beautiful than him. There is nothing in this world who can compare to him. He is so far above all of creation that we don't even have the human vernacular to describe him. We don't have the words to begin to describe how beautiful and magnificent he is. But the false picture of God that we have, we can describe him. We can describe what he's like. Oh, but not the God in this picture. He is majestic. He is so much better, so much greater. And he is faithful because look at the rainbow that the appearance of an emerald surrounding the throne. That right there is a picture of God's faithfulness. The rainbow should cause us to think about the flood. In Genesis chapter 9, after God had flooded the earth, what did he tell Noah? I will never flood the earth again. And he made a covenant with him. And the sign of the covenant was a rainbow. So the rainbow that surrounds God's throne shows that he is a faithful God. That he is faithful to his word. And he is faithful to you. So many of our false pictures of God, we wonder if he's just waiting for us to mess up so he can go away. How many of us view God and we think we have to do good enough or do enough, otherwise God won't want us anymore. We think that if I don't do perfectly here, if I'm not good enough, if I don't make the right donations at the right place, if I don't give enough of my time to certain areas, if I don't do this or I don't do this, then God's just going to throw his hands at, in the air at me and he'll be done with me. I mean, how many of our pictures of God make him out to be someone vindictive who's just waiting for us to mess up? But he's not like that. He's faithful, he's good, and he loves his people, and he has covenant faithfulness throughout all eternity to them. One bad day is not going to send you to hell if you are a believer. God loves you too much to lose you, and he is too powerful to let anyone snatch you out of his hand. He's faithful. And in case you need more proof of that, look at the 24 thrones of the 24 elders that further affirm his faithfulness. Around the throne, there were 24 thrones. On the throne set four, 24 elders dressed in white clothes with golden crowns on their heads. Now, there's some debate as to who these 24 elders are. Just to be honest with you, some people think these are the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. And these are the 12 apostles. These are the saints who are around the throne of God. Some people believe these are angels. These are angels who represent symbolically the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. And throughout Revelation, we see a pretty clear distinction between the role of an angel and the role of a saint. So I take them to be angels who symbolize the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. But no matter how you take that to mean, it means the same thing. It communicates the same thing. God is faithful to his people. He was faithful to them in the Old Testament. He is faithful to those who have faith in his name in the New Testament. He is faithful throughout all of time and space. There's never been a moment where God hasn't been faithful, and there will never be a moment where God is not faithful. Think about that next time you wonder, can God really love someone like me? Can God really tolerate someone like me? I know how much I mess up. I know how sinful I am. I know how angry I get. God has to be done with someone like me. But he's not. He's faithful. A false picture of God will make you think you have to keep earning his love. The true picture of God says, no, I love you perfectly. I can't love you any less, and I can't love you any more than I do right now. Because this God that we serve is a faithful God. He's always been faithful. He is faithful in this current moment, and he always will be. 
That's the God who sits on the throne. He is a God of all majesty, and he is faithful to his people. Look at verse 5. Flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder came from the throne. Seven fiery torches were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So we see his faithfulness in the rainbow and in the 24 elders. We see his majesty and the way John describes him with these stones and with the fact there are there's thunder and there's lightning before the throne. This God is all powerful. This God is, has all majesty, and this God rules and reigns forever. And just to prove further that he's faithful, there are seven fiery torches before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And we've talked about this before. What are the seven spirits of God? What's the sevenfold work of the Holy Spirit? And we see this in Isaiah 11, verse 2. If you want to turn there, you can. If not, it will be on the screen. But it says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. The one that indwells you is the one who testifies the very faithfulness of God in your life. He comforts you, he empowers you, he enables you, and he allows you to draw near and to pray to your heavenly Father who sits on the throne. How can we doubt the majesty and the faithfulness of such a God? But so often, we make him lesser than that. So often, we don't recognize that his majesty is not in question. So often, we question his faithfulness. Can this God really love me? But this picture in Revelation, we don't have room to question him. He has all majesty. He is faithful to his covenant people. And he is so much better than any picture of God you have in your mind. He is so much better than any picture of God we can edit, amplify, or remove attributes from. He is so much better than whatever we can ask or think or come up with. He's better. And John can't even describe him. We can't even describe how wonderful this God is. And so don't settle for a false picture that wants to make him lesser. Don't settle for a false picture that wants to make him more like us. No, recognize that he is so much greater than we are. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And the God of the Bible is better than whatever God we come up with in our mind. But I would argue that this isn't the part we wrestle with the most when it comes to God. The attribute we wrestle with the most isn't his majesty. His faithfulness, yes, but I would argue that we wrestle most with his holiness. Which is why a true biblical picture of God forces us to respond to his holiness. Look at what happens in verses 6 through 8. Something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal, was also before the throne. Four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back were around the throne on each side. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. And day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy. Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. What happens is we see this thing like a sea of glass, this vastness. It's not a literal sea. John's using simile. It's like this. And the reason why it's not a literal sea is because throughout Revelation, the sea represents the abyss. The sea represents evil. It represents wickedness. There is no evil or wickedness in the throne room of God because he is holy what this thing like a sea of glass represents is the vastness of God, the never-ending nature of God, the greatness of God, and the very vastness of His holiness. The very attribute that these four living creatures cover with eyes mean they are vigilantly watching the holiness of God and the move and the glory of God and His creation. These creatures that are similar to what we see in Ezekiel chapter 1 and in Isaiah chapter 6. These living creatures with one like a lion being there is royal power. One like an ox meaning strength. One like a man meaning spiritual. And one like a flying eagle representing their swiftness. These 
angels, these creatures, these beings that we can even comprehend are the ones who spend day and night, hour after hour, minute after minute, second after second, not singing grace, grace, grace. Not singing love, 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 but singing holy, holy, holy. Because above all, God is a holy God. He is pure. There is no sin in him. He is set apart from sin. There is no wickedness in him. He is perfectly good. But so often, that's the attribute that we most want to edit. That's the attribute we want to remove. Because if we can remove the holiness of God, then we can do whatever we want. I mean, if we can dilute the holiness of God, then it's saying, well, God doesn't really care if I do some things. He just cares when I do the really bad thing. But we also don't like God's holiness because it forces us to acknowledge that God also has wrath. That God judges. That God is just. We don't, we don't like that. Now, that, that means we have to change. That means if God is holy, and we really look at ourselves, we realize we're not. And if we recognize that we're not holy, but God is, that means we've got to change something. Well, that means we have to believe a certain way. It means we have to believe in wrath. We have to believe in hell. We don't like that. We want to kind of put that one away. No, God is love. God is gracious. Oh, he's so merciful. But if we don't have the holiness of God, we don't have the grace of God, we don't have the love of God, we don't have a God worth worshiping. Because if God is not holy, then God cannot love. If God is not holy, then he cannot be faithful. If God is not holy, then he cannot be gracious. If God is not holy, then he cannot be merciful. If God is not holy, then there is no salvation. We are all dead and damned in our sin. But because God is holy, because he cannot tolerate sin, because he deals with sin, the greatest act of love in all of creation is his greatest act of holiness. Because in this greatest act of love where Jesus went to the cross, what did our holy and righteous and just God do? He made him who knew no sin to be sin, and he poured out the full cup of his wrath on him to deal with sin. We look to the cross and we say God is love. Yes, but God is chiefly holy. And if we miss the holiness of God, then we don't get the love, the grace, the mercy, or anything that makes God worth worshiping. We can't ignore the holiness of God. We can't try to dilute it. We can't remove it from him because God is chiefly holy. His love is holy. His grace is holy. His judgment is holy. His wrath is holy. To remove the holiness of God means that we are damned in our sins and we have no hope. God's holiness is his chief attribute. There is no other attribute of God saying like this. Holy, holy, holy. And if God is holy, which he is, if that's the picture that God presents of himself, then that demands a response from us. So how do we respond to such a holy God? Well, I want to give you three simple ways to respond. They won't be on the screen, so you got to listen. So if you're not listening, this is your chance to kind of come in. How do you respond to a holy God? First and foremost, you repent. Now we talk about repentance, and y'all know it's like my favorite word up here. I don't, I don't like repentance. Y'all know that, right? Like, I don't like owning that there's something wrong with me. But repentance is a gift and a grace from God. And the only way we can begin to respond to the holiness of God is to repent. It means if we find ourselves being bitter and angry, we repent. It means we find ourselves being consumed with adultery and lust, we repent. If it means we find any sin that has been uncovered by the Holy Spirit in our lives, we don't tolerate it, we don't minimize it, we don't give in to it, we repent. So what does it mean to repent? We've said it means to turn from something and turn to God. And yes, but I heard a definition this week that I really like. And it's from Stephen Rummage, and I want to give it to you. He said that repentance is a change of mind that, re- that leads to a change of heart and results in a change of direction. Let me say that again. 
Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart that results in a change of direction. So what do we got to change our mind about? Well, we got to quit tolerating our sin thinking it's okay to do so. We've got to quit compromising with it and think it's okay for me to have my own stuff. I kind of have, have my God time here, have my me time here. I'm going to do whatever I want here. I'll come to church on Sunday and I'll be okay. We've got to quit that. We've got to quit thinking that Christianity is a one-day-a-week relationship. It's every day. It's every minute of the day. There is never a moment, think about this, where you are not in the presence of this holy God. He sees everything. He knows everything. It's not just a Sunday morning religion. It's a relation that takes 24 hours out of seven days of the week, every week for every year, every moment of our lives. If you are born again, you can't just say, well, I'm a Christian because I come to church. No. Do you respond to the holiness of God by day in and day out, assessing where have I fallen short? Where is my lack of holiness? And where do I need to repent? Where do I need to change my mind and view this as God views it? That leads to a heart that hates it like God hates it. And a change of direction where I'm running from what God hates to the God that I love. That's what repentance is. A change of mind that leads to a change of heart that results in a change of direction. And we are a people, if we are born again, who are to have a lifestyle of repentance. Not because it makes us miserable, but because it frees us to experience the manifest presence of God. And don't you as a believer want that? Don't you want to experience God? Your sin keeps you from experiencing him. And this holy, holy God has gifted you repentance. To change your mind, to change your heart, and to change your direction. So how do you respond to a holy God? You repent. Secondly, you rely on the Holy Spirit. You rely on the Holy Spirit. I mean, think about this for a moment. We don't often give this enough attention The holy God of all creation, perfect in all his ways, completely separate from sin, is the same God who sent his one and only son to die on the cross for our sin, and he rose him from the grave to raise us to newness of life. And not only that, he then puts his very spirit in us to make us more holy and to lead us to pursue holiness. What kind of God does that? The God of the Bible does. Not the one you have in your mind. Not the one you're coming up with. Not the one you're probably ignoring right now. No, no, no. This God did. He put his very spirit in you to make you more holy and to lead you to pursue holiness. So how can you hope to be holy if you're not relying on him? You can't. I mean, we don't have it in us. In our flesh... We're always going to give into our sin. In our flesh, when we see passages like, forgive those who wrong me, or to be forgiving, or to not be angry, to let the sun go down your anger, or to not give in to lust, or stuff like that, too. We read passages like that, and we say, no, I can handle this myself. I got this. No, in 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 ourselves, we're always going to give in. We're not going to forgive. We're going to hold grudges. We're, We're not going to give up our lust. We're going to indulge ourselves any way we want. But the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the strength to overcome. The Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to walk in victory. And the Holy Spirit is available and in you right now. How often do you rely on him? How often do you sit with him? We spend so much time in our churches talking about Jesus, and we should. Jesus was here for 33 years. The Holy Spirit's been here for 2,000. He barely gets a minute in sermon. He barely gets a second in the believer's life. Yet he's the one who enables us to be more like Christ. He's the one who makes us more holy. He's the one that enables us to repent. So how do you respond to a holy God? You repent. You turn away from your sin. You change your mind. You don't view sin the same way that you once did. And then you rely on the Holy Spirit to strengthen you to walk in holiness. And the third way that we respond to the holiness of God is also the third step to embrace this complete picture of God. And that's for us to rejoice because he is worthy. 
rejoice because he is worthy. Let's look at verses 9 through 11. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne and say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Right here in Revelation 4, we are given the first two hymns in the book of Revelation, but there's more to come. And right here, they proclaim, holy, holy, holy. And then they proclaim in verse 11 that he is worthy. He is worthy of all praise. He is worthy of all commitment. He is worthy of the pains of repentance. He is worthy of denying sin and running to him. He is worthy of giving your lives for his cause. He is worthy of all worship and adoration that you can possibly give him. He's worthy of every ounce of rejoicing you can give. But let's just be very honest right now. We know what the Bible says. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter trials of various kinds. We know in 1 Thessalonians we are told to rejoice always in the Lord. Oh, but it's so hard to do that in this world. I mean, let's be real here. Isn't it hard to rejoice when life is going terrible? I mean, isn't it hard to rejoice when things aren't going your way? It's really easy to rejoice when life's going good. But what happens when everything you've ever known changes in a moment? What happens when you get the news you didn't want to hear? Is rejoicing easy? No. But the Bible doesn't promise that it's easy. But it calls us to do it. Because the Holy Spirit who lives in us enables us to. But we often don't view rejoicing as a state of mind or a state of being. We view it as just an act of being happy. I mean, let's be real here. We confuse joy with happiness a lot. To be joyful is to be happy. To rejoice is to act happy. And that's not what it is. See, somebody who does not have a complete picture of God, but somebody who has an edited picture of God, you know how we'll handle trials when they come? When life gets hard, We won't rejoice, but this will be our response. Let's say life gets hard. You don't get the job you want. Someone you love passes away. Or maybe life's just not going great. Your kids aren't doing great. Your personal life's not doing great. And when it feels terrible, you know what? We'll respond and we'll say, God, how could you do this to me? God, why are you doing this to me? God, I don't deserve this. God, there's no reason for you to do this to me. How could you do this? That's what an edited picture of God will lead us to do. You know what the complete picture will do? Don't get me wrong. It it won't make you smile when when you have pain. It won't make you happy when the situation doesn't call for it. But to count a joy and to rejoice is not just to be happy and smile and just get through it. But rather to say, God, I don't know why this is happening. God, I, I can't do this. But I trust you're on your throne. And I trust that you're reigning and you're ruling, even though I can't see it. And you know, I may not be happy right now. I may feel miserable. But God, I'm going to rejoice because you're holding me together. God, I'm going to have joy because this trial is not determined by my strength, but the strength that you give me gets me through it. And God, I know that no matter what happens tomorrow, I know that you're in control. I don't care what happened yesterday because you're in control. And whatever happens today, you're in control. God, I can't feel anything right now. I'm numb and I hurt. But God, I trust you because you're worthy. I trust you because you're faithful. And I trust you because of your majesty. And I trust you because of your holiness. That's what it means to rejoice. Not to be happy, not to smile and get through it, but to trust the one who's on the throne and to trust that he's got you when you don't feel like you have anything together and to run to him and to cling to him. That's what it means to rejoice in a God who is worthy. It means to trust that whenever life doesn't make sense, he is reigning and he is ruling. He created all things. And by his will, they exist and were created. And he's the one who has the authority to bring it to an end. And he will one day.
While we're here, he could do it any minute, any second. But while we're here, we rejoice because he's worthy. This is the picture of God the Bible gives us. This is the complete and clear picture of God. But I fear that even though we see this picture, we might do with this picture what we do with other pictures. We just kind of see it. You know what I mean? When someone goes on vacation and they come back, like for instance, last week when Emily Duckworth thought it was funny to send me a picture of her on the beach saying, that's where we're worshiping today. I saw the picture. I didn't like the picture. And I wanted to tell her she has to go to a different church, but it's fine. But when I saw that picture, that's just it. I just saw it. I couldn't experience it. I wasn't there. I could see it. I could see the sand, I could see the beach, I could see the sun rising. I could get jealous, but I couldn't experience it. And so many of us, I feel like, will look at this picture of Revelation chapter 4, and we'll settle just to see it. But you don't have to settle just to see it. In fact, don't settle just to see it. But experience the God who's in the picture. You get to experience him. So what does that look like? What does it mean to not just see the picture, but to experience it? Well, let me show you this. I got a picture in my slide today. Dennis, can you go there? There we go. You all see that picture? Good picture, right? One of the two people in here looks really good. The other one can be cut out. But we were at Orange Beach in 2019. Now, I love Orange Beach. I love going to the beach. I burn, but I like going. And while we were there, we took this picture while we were on the sands of Orange Beach. Now, you see that, and you see sand behind us, you see some water, you see two people smiling, and you can see that, right? But let me tell you, you didn't experience that picture. There was nobody happy in that picture. Let me tell you what happened. I had this tendency to think I have good ideas, and then when I execute them, they're not good ideas. So we took our vacation in 2019, and I decided, you know what? It costs a lot of money to stay on the beach, so here's what we'll do. We'll stay in Mobile, Alabama, which if you've ever been to Mobile, Alabama, I'm sorry, that place is awful. <laughs> it's bad. And so we went there, we'll get a hotel room, and you know what, we'll drive to the beach. We're an hour away from Orange Beach, we're an hour away from Pensacola. This makes sense. So we wake up, we go to Orange Beach. Renee's already mad at me because we left about an hour later than we were supposed to. So we're driving there, and I'm trying to, you know, make this a good day, you know, but justly so, she's mad at me. And we finally get to the beach. And as we start walking on the beach, you know what happens? They're putting out a siren for everyone to evacuate it. Because the storm's coming in. And so I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm in trouble. And Renee goes, we're getting our beach picture. And so she said, we're going to that sand. So we went to the sand, and she held the camera up, took the picture, and that's what you see. Two smiling faces, but you didn't experience that picture. I see that picture, and I don't go, oh, great memories. I laugh because I messed up. But that's the thing. You see it. Happy people. I've experienced it. I know what was going on in that picture. I experienced the wrath of a, of a wife who just wanted to swim at the beach and couldn't. I experienced the embarrassment of thinking my good idea was good when it was really bad. In the same way, don't settle for just seeing the picture of God, but you can experience him. You don't have to see that he's faithful. You can experience his faithfulness. You don't have to just see that he is majestic. You get to experience his majesty. You don't just get to see that he is holy. You get to experience his holiness. And you don't just get to see that he's worthy. You get to experience his worthiness. Don't settle just for seeing the picture, but experience what's going on in this picture. Because for all those who, in, who are in Christ, this is what we get to do for all eternity. We get to experience this God and we can experience him today. The faithful and holy and majestic and worthy God. We get to experience him, but we so often settle for such a lesser picture that we can see. We see it, we might think about it from time to time, but you know what? We can't be bothered by it. But I'm telling you, God has so much more for you than just an edited picture. He doesn't just want you to see this clear and complete picture of who he is. He is inviting you to come and to experience it, to come and to not just say holy, 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 but to rejoice in seeing holy, holy, holy. He is calling you to experience his love, his faithfulness, his holiness that transforms you, that renews you, and 
and that saves you. He is inviting you to come experience him day in and day out, to not settle for something so much lesser, but to run to the one who is worthy, to run to the one who is holy, and to run to the one who has shown his faithfulness perfectly in the person and work of Jesus. Why would you settle for so much less when you can experience 